Now that I got to play a little Total War Troy, I'm joined by one of the senior designers, Milcho Vasilev, to talk about how they're combining the mythology of ancient Troy with Total War mechanics. So the, the biggest aspect, I think, for Troy is how does the mythology tie into the game? Yeah, so we were exploring this period, which is so back in time, uh, the end of the Bronze Age. And there is a very, very little record of what exactly, how exactly things were at the time. We do have artifacts and archaeological finds because fortunately bronze ages pretty well uh, in the ground and we can still dig those stuff up and make some educated guesses about how people probably lived or behaved or how they constructed cities and so on. But most of it all remains a mystery to us. So we were thinking really hard about how to approach this period because this is the first time that a Total War game goes so back in time all the way to the Bronze Age. And we decided that um, Homer's Iliad could be a perfect inspiration for us because uh, even though it's probably a work of fiction, it has recently been discovered that it is based on true events. And even though what Homer writes about is probably not, it didn't probably occur exactly as he said it, a lot of the characters, the kings, the locations, they probably did exist. So you're saying the um, centaurs and there's, there's um, minotaurs in the game. How, how much of the, the myth of that era are you tapping into when it comes to what units you can create? We are more or less scratching the surfaces of the myths. We are still keeping the game quite historical and all the mythic units are things that are optional. You, players usually need to go out of their way, conquer certain regions or gain the favor of certain gods in to be able to recruit those types of units. But the whole aesthetic of the game is uh, a sort of an exploration of the myths. Because even when you look at the campaign map, you can see that the unexplored parts of the campaign map are um, shrouded uh, by, uh, by this, we call it uh, the Shroud of War, which um, obscures vision on the map. And it's uh, decorated with all those mythical beings on it, those uh, mythical cities and so on. But once you get to explore the lands, the Shroud burns away and reveals what what is the truth behind uh, those myths that were there. So without giving too much away then, is there going to be more aspects then that people are going to recognize from what they learn in history that you're kind of implementing the game beyond, you know, Minotaurs and, and, and things yes, like that? Yes, we do have, we'd have more than that. In fact, we divide them into several different types. Like the Minotaur is one type, which is a single entity, unique kind of uh, mythological unit, because you can't have two Minotaurs in, in your uh, army. He is a special type of unit, which you will need to earn. You need to earn the favor of Zeus, I believe, in order to be able to access him in campaign. And he is a strong unit, but uh, he is uh, one and unique, where we have other mythic units like the Centaur, who are a whole bunch of, uh, like a whole tribe and different units, because I'm not sure if you played the demo, uh, which we gave in the demo, you had only Centaurs with spears and shields, but in the game there are Centaurs with uh, javelins or uh, scouting Centaurs or Centaurs with bows. And this goes on for the other mythic units type as well. We have other uh, single and unique mythic units like the Cyclops, for example, or other uh, mythic units that can be a, uh, a whole group like the Giants. And uh, what we also have on the campaign map, uh, the return of agents for a saga game. And uh, we do also have some uh, mythic uh, agents, which we call them, which are only represented on the campaign map and don't really fight in the battles. And then we have this whole new divine will system, which represents the way people interacted with the gods at the time, because people were really, really religious uh, in the Bronze Age. They believing that gods were walking among them and were all over the world, everywhere in their lives. And so we have this system in which the player 
can do can try to appease the gods in different ways and gain the favor of different gods thus gaining different boons in either campaign or battle it feels like there's an extra layer of, of strategy now that you've kind of revamped the resource system as well instead of just purely if you have enough gold you can buy this unit can you how is that going to play into the the grand campaign as well as in in battles well the new multiple resource economy system that we have in troy has a huge ba- uh, huge impact in every single aspect of the game because this is something that uh, hasn't been done in a total war game before but we believe that it really opens up the game giving different tactical advantages uh, mostly on the campaign map but also in battles because of the types of troops that you can recruit. Because now, instead of just having one resource in gold, for example, like you have in previous game, you have five different trade resources which you have to actively gather or try to trade with other factions so that you can get them. Because this only came natural with the Bronze Age, because we knew that in the Bronze Age uh, they were not really using a single currency for exchanges and so on. They were usually doing barters in goods, like um, if you have access to a lot of food, you might give that food to a neighboring faction so that you get some wood from them, for example. And so even at the start of the campaign, different factions have access to different resources. So your faction might be very rich in a place where there's access to a lot of bronze and a lot of gold, but you probably don't have access to food and you need to figure out ways in which you can acquire that food. You can try and barter for it and give your precious resources of gold and bronze to get that food, or you can try and conquer neighboring factions that have access to some food and try it in an offensive way. This is all up to the player, of course. And when it comes to units and so on, of course, different those different resources are used for different types of stuff. So you need a lot of food to be able to sustain large armies and to be able to recruit new units and so on. But if you want to really get elite units, really powerful units, you will need to have access to bronze or gold. But without the food, you will still have a very small army, which even if it's filled with elite units, might not be able to withstand attacks coming out from different directions and so on. So you need to decide what you want to aim for. And the the wood and the stone you will need for buildings to improve on your settlements, to make sure that your economy is growing and can support even larger armies and uh, make you a stronger and more influential part on the campaign. You you talked like about you know what what you need to create your your armies, but I feel like in in Troy the armies that uh, the armies are going to look a lot different than in, in previous Total Wars because now infantry are so much more important. Maybe because of the technological restrictions and resource restrictions of the time, you've had to revamp infantry. Yes, uh, we knew when we were making a game about the Bronze Age that this was going to be one of the biggest challenges that we were going to face. Because there is a reason why the Total War series haven't gone that back in time until now. And yes, we knew that this period is dominated by infantry combat because that is how they did war at the time. And so we knew that uh, we had to make sure that infantry against infantry still feels interesting to play. And uh, we did a lot of things to try and improve upon that. There, there's not something that is revolutionary in the game, but what we've did is we've taken the weight classes that we usually had for units and made them much more distinct, giving the infantry units different types of classes and different purposes inside the battle. Like um, the heavy infantry is the, are the toughest units which can go and fight hand to hand with others and are really to take head on. But um, if uh, they get tired really quickly, if they have to move from one location to another to defend different places, they will become exhausted. And uh, becoming exhausted now has uh, larger impacts on uh, on units on the battlefield. So they will lose more of their defense or offense skill and will become easier targets for enemies. Whereas light infantry, even though they can't really stand toe to toe with the heavier counterpart, they can outmaneuver them, outflank them, 
they don't get tired as quickly. They can move fast throughout the battlefield and ignore some of the new terrain types that we've um, put on, like the mud, which will slow down the heavier units a lot more and have a huge impact on them, whereas it will have almost no impact on light infantry because they can just uh, walk through it pretty fast and use, uh, for example, the tall grass terrain feature in which they can hide and wait for an ambush and try to do some more tact, something more tactical. It feels like a lot of what you're doing is, it feels like almost like a test bed for Total Wars to come. There's a lot of tweaks that you're making and experimenting with new things like, like the resource system and reworking infantry. Do you do you feel like this, like you're kind of at the cutting edge of what Total War is going to be now, like mixing mythology with history and experiment with new things? Well, since this is a, a saga title and saga titles are a bit smaller in scope, usually focused on a single conflict in time rather than a whole era, we believe that saga titles are the perfect opportunity for us to be trying new things because um, we are yet to see how all those new features will be received by the players and how, how they will like them or not like them. And uh, that's why we think that this kind of title is the perfect fit for something like that. And it all just made perfect sense in hindsight when you look at it, when you look at the era the, that we're trying to cover with all the mythology behind it. And it just makes sense for those things to be there. So do you think that, I suppose, depending on how well Troy is received, do you think it might give you the opportunity to revisit cultures and eras that have already been explored in Total War, but not to the level of combining mythology and inspirations? It's absolutely possible, uh, of course. I mean, we always try to learn from the previous titles and see what people enjoy or don't enjoy. Like, for example, we knew that a lot of uh, the new diplomacy system that we introduced in uh, Total War Three Kingdoms was very well received by a lot of players. So we decided that we should incorporate that diplomacy system into Troy as well. So all those barter agreements that you can do, the quick deal, the make it work buttons and so on. This is all in the Total War Troy as well. And I imagine that uh, this can keep on going in the future, where if uh, something proves to be a really great concept, like the multiple resource economy, for example, or the mythological layer of it all, we can go on and keep doing that in other Total War titles. So I think the, the main thing that people think of when you talk about Troy, other than Brad Pitt in, in bronze armor. Um, are you going to implement a big horse full of men? Well, both yes, and not exactly in the way that you probably imagine it. So, of course, this is the Trojan War, and we had to have a Trojan horse of some sorts. So we were thinking a lot about how how to represent this myth about the Trojan horse uh, being uh, a, the, the way that the Odysseus tricked uh, the Trojans into sneaking up some units inside the city and so on. So we had several different ideas about it. And in the end, we just decided that we're going to incorporate all of them. So there's different ways in which the Trojan horse might appear to you in game. One of them is this traditional thing that uh, with the gift of uh, the wooden horse with soldiers uh, inside, hiding inside of it. But it's again a bit uh, more realistically done, so to speak, because after doing some research, we saw that um, the Phoenicians uh, ships usually had horse heads on top of them. And um, if you, in campaign you are playing with Odysseus, or if you manage to get Odysseus on your side or confederate him, because that is possible to happen, uh, he, he might come, come up with a plan where you ta take one of those ships, you fill it up with gold and goods and offerings to the gods and give it to the Trojans for them to take inside your city. But people are actually hiding inside the ship. And so the players will be able, if they get to experience that scenario, because as I said, you need to have access to Odysseus in one way or another in order to do that exact thing. 
players can decide which units they want to sneak into the city and uh, once the the trap is sprung they will get to play a different battle map of troy where they will start with some of their units already inside of the city uh, the gates opened and the rest of their army outside and the battle would be fought at night and so it will have a much much more different feel to it than if you just decide to assault troy's head on and this is just one of the representations of the Trojan horse that we've had. Because, for example, another probably not so popular theory was that after excavating through Troy and looking at the walls, archaeolog uh, archaeologists uh, found that the walls of Troy were a bit like wave-like uh, structure to them. And they were really curious about why that would have been. And later it was discovered that it was most probably due to earthquake because this, this region is very seismic and the period itself was uh, also very seismic. So it is quite possible that it was actually an earthquake that brought down the walls of Troy because uh, Poseidon, who's um, animal associated with him because Greeks used to associate a lot of animals with their gods always is the horse. Poseidon is also the god of earthquakes, uh, also the god of seas and oceans, but, in, but the god of earthquakes as well. So it might be Poseidon's doing that uh, he caused an earthquake that would shatter the walls of Troy, thus being interpreted as the Trojan horse. So if you get to experience that scenario, and that scenario can be experienced with all the factions because it's an earthquake, and you take advantage of it and attack the Troy right after the, this earthquake, again, the battle map will be vastly different with most of the walls of Troy, well, at least the outer walls of it crumbled and turned to dust and uh, defensive towers would be broken. So you have much easier uh, time uh, assaulting the city. So this is another representation that we have of the Trojan horse. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom, all things Troy. Um, I suppose as soon as you guys let me play, I'll definitely be playing again and I'll share it with everyone at home. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on. Thanks for having me. <laughs>